so um, I'm back with my um, iPad to uh, critique 21st century capitalism. I couldn't have done it without my, my iPad here and my Apple Pencil um, because these these are the tools that we think with, right? And it's one of the critiques that my prior video received was that I was critiquing capitalism on a MacBook, which is to say um, using the products that only, the argument goes, that only capitalism could have produced to critique capitalism. And um, perfectly, it's a perfectly accurate claim or description of what I am doing, but I think it it um, you know it kind of proves the point that a dialectical philosopher is trying to make, which is that, um, and a Marxist is trying to make, right? And I personally don't feel the need to identify myself as a Marxist. I I don't identify with Marxism. I see its its um, value. And I am, um, you know, I take it seriously enough to have to to have read Marx and to have read not all, but I've read a lot of Marx. I've read commentary on Marx, and I've read contemporary Marxist philosophy, and I find it fascinating and interesting and helpful. Um, I'm not a materialist. I'm not a dialectical materialist. Even I think that there are other avenues for the transformation of the human being than just um, politics and economics or political economy. I think um, we need to do political theology. I think we need to think about um, religion and practice religion and not pretend like, I mean, this, the standard Marxist position would be to pretend like religion can be something overcome. Marx is, is a modern thinker, right, who, who is all about um, the emancipation of human beings through the mastery of nature, like their own nature and um, physical nature. He's, in that sense, committed to the technological project, which is, you know, as Fichte and Feuerbach, Feuerbach his, his disciple, articulated it, the, the, trans, the transformation of um, a determined and mechanical nature by or through the power of the freedom of a, of a creative mind, right? This is the Fichtean, um, you know, empowerment of a kind of transcendental philosophy that he inherited from Kant, right? And there are a lot of books to read in the world, and so I know it's like for some of you, name dropping is helpful, and for others, it's it um, obscures what I'm trying to say, and it feels like a power play or something. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't lift weights, right? I lift books, and there are different kinds of exercise, and so when you when you want to. Uh, enter the gymnasium to philosophize. It's helpful to have done the reading first. Um, and, you know, again, in this Zizek Peterson debate, we kind of saw what happens when you do the reading and when you don't. It's one thing to uh, be a charismatic and creative mind and, um, you know, wing it after cramming for the test the night before. It's another thing to be a creative mind and to have done the reading, to have you know read Peterson's books and watched Peterson's um, lectures and um, read Marx. And you know Peterson's read his his fair share of Jung, I imagine. Um, you know we've got the uh, complete works down there. Um, not that I've read them all, but I try to read widely in the thinkers that I talk about um, authoritatively. So it's important. It's important to do the reading, and yeah, you know, here I am on my MacBook critiquing capitalism, and 
as a philosopher who does take dialectic thought and dialectic dialectical ontology seriously you know, I'm a process relational thinker and you know Alfred North Whitehead the originator of this way of thinking is his philosophy is not incompatible with Marxism but it provides a totally different imaginative background to Marx's theory of political economy a different it's it's Whitehead is rooted deeper in a cosmological register whereas Marx is assuming a modern cosmology and from within that um, frame of reference where the scientific intellect has found a way to harness the power of nature by treating it as a machine and gaining mastery over it. Like Marx assumed that that was the trajectory of history from this point forward and that what it means to be a human being is to be able to harness the power of nature, to objectify nature, and not just, again, physical nature, but to objectify, master, and to reshape human nature. Um, and this is the part of Marx that, like, you see also in, um, I'd say, it's, this is the part of Marxism. I think, you know, Marx is a complex, brilliant human being, and his thoughts develop over the course of his life, and he doesn't always agree with himself. And, you know, whenever you examine a thinker, there's there's so much more nuance than than the the sort of ideological um, slogan making that politics forces us into. Like to, to bring philosophy into politics is 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 helpful, but also you can if you wield the names of philosophers like weapons, then you end up making the situation worse. Like you, you may as well just have a fist fight rather than pretending to like de debate and defeat one another with ideas, right? Because ideas are always something we share. And so if two people enter a debate and at the end of it, one thinks like, believes like they, that they won, that means that it failed, like the whole enterprise failed. Like if, the, if any truth was held, it's because it transcended the individual minds of either of the interlocutors present on the stage and allowed each of them to rise into a higher a higher plane of understanding a, a deeper context um, of interpretation so that they both leave the event having um, understood something new together and so you know some commentary on the, on the debate pointed out that uh, if you watch it just as a in terms of the affect being exchanged, I mean, um, Zizek was like looking at Peterson far more, like really trying to talk to him. Um, you know, like after the opening statements and then when they started to get warmed up, and whereas Peterson would would really get kind of lost in his own thought, and you know, it's not that Zizek wasn't repeating old jokes. Um, in in a sense, one of Zizek's best joke jokes is, is that he repeats jokes, so it's okay, I think. But I think he was still trying to, Zizek was trying to, I think, open the space on that stage. And, you know, Peterson was, was willing to, to go there. I think he, you know, if you just look at Peterson's, like, fascination as he sat on the couch, like, leaning over into um, Zizek's uh, space of, of, of charismatic dialectical utterance. Um, Peterson was transfixed, I think, at different moments. And he allowed that, I think, to be clear. And hopefully, with Peterson having had his experience and um, the audience having taken in this exchange and then you know ostensibly it's about happiness right they talked a little bit about it but they both kind of put happiness to the side and said it's not the end of human life there's some other end and you know Zizek is ultimately a philosopher he's, he's a Socratic philosopher ultimately um, and in that sense committed to the dialectic committed to realizing a truth and you know, this is why he likes to tell jokes and at one point he 
says to Peterson, like, I'm really just trying to get you to tell a joke. Like, lighten up, man. Uh, there was widespread agreement between the two on many issues, but at the end of the day, the fundamental, I think, psychological and, and disagreement on the level of personality for the two of them about happiness was um, that, you know, so, as someone on Twitter put it, Zizek is like a happy trash panda, and Peterson looks like the most depressed person on earth. Um, you know, the trash panda reference, I think, is to this documentary where Peterson, uh, sorry, the, the documentary where Zizek was saying that he's standing in a, um, a trash dump, a landfill, right? And there's like, you know, dump trucks uh, dumping out another load of. Uh, recycling and and Zizek says this is ecology right and his his general approach to understanding the embeddedness of capitalism and the economy and human culture in, in an ecological um, in its ecological context he says to do so now for people living under techno capitalism is to remember that the the the, the trash heap the Landfill is um, ecology. That is the environment that human beings now inhabit. We've created, um, we've transformed the earth into asphalt and plastic and a whole shit ton of CO2. It's a time bomb. We've already released it into the atmosphere and the effect that the carbon we've all read and the methane that's, you know, as a result of industrial, especially fossil fuel driven um, political economy, um, we've released a time bomb. And, um, you know, the longer we wait to, to accept the fact that we've released it already and take the steps necessary, and it's, it's not like we know what steps to take exactly, but I think we have clear ways we can start which have a lot to do with what the Green New Deal is about. And anything, I mean, I mean it's, it's a sketch, right? The Green New Deal, help us, is what I would say to those who think that it's just a communist takeover. Get, you know, this is, democracy um, hasn't had the best reputation among philosophers for the last um, 2,500 years or so of Greek, European, and North American history. Democracy is messy, and democracy um, takes the decision-making power away from the centralized elites, the technocrats, um, whether they are priests or economists or shareholders, um, Uh, or politicians, when you unleash the power of individual freedom in, in uh, collective, with collective love, right? when, when individual freedom and um, social relationship becomes when they when they, they 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 only ever actually arise together, you you can't get one without the other. Um, without social cohesion, there is no um, individual creativity. Freedom isn't just like a right that we come pre-installed with, as when we're born into you know our individuality. Freedom is something we develop and cultivate and practice and exercise and um, if we're lucky and if we're committed we we deepen our capacity to be free and you know it's not something that we just possess automatically or at least um, it's it's power it's potential it's it's intensity is variable right it depends on these other factors depends on its, you know, the family that a person is born into, the, the 
economic um, conditions, the material conditions, the um, educational opportunities, the social bonds, um, the food that one is eating, the, the role, the relationship that has to brain development through you know, infancy and childhood and um, into adulthood, uh, trauma. So it's so variable to think of freedom as something abstract, like a right. Um, I think it's important for like writing constitutions, I get that, I'm not denying that. We need to agree on like what we let people do, what we allow one another to do without the risking like, you know, the imposition of collective power to prevent it. But to, to try to separate freedom from communion, to try to separate individuality from society, I think is a mistake. And I, a lot of people agree about that, I'm sure. So maybe that's um, maybe that's all I'll say in this in this video. I think I wanted to get to some of the responding to some of the comments under my prior video, which I took some notes on on my um, iPad, which I'm you know using to critique capitalism. Anyways, um, please continue to share your thoughts with me. I appreciate them. I tend to not pay as much attention to the ones that are like, oh man, you're brilliant, or oh man, you're a fucking idiot. And I get lots of both of those. Um, I, I like when people just engage and say something interesting. Um, anyways, thanks for listening.